Hi everybody, I'm Tim from TroutandFeather.com and thanks for viewing this YouTube fly tying tutorial on Tube Flies Part 2. In case you missed Part 1, I'll put a link to it up on the screen right now, either on my right or my left, and you can click there and go back and watch that initial video. Related to that first one, I want to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who sent me such kind and positive comments. There was a common thread that I noticed throughout some of the messages that I received, and it was that, like me, a lot of other tires out there were initially tentative before getting into the world of tube flies. But since they made that move, they've been absolutely excited. So if you're out there right now and you have yet to make that transition into tube flies, I'm going to greatly encourage you to do so. Purchase some of the materials, get the vise adapter, and start tying. You could be extremely creative, you'll soon realize that it's absolutely limitless and the best part about tube flies is that there's really no rules out there. One of the messages that I received was from Sean and it kind of went a different direction. Now for starters, Sean is one of my channel subscribers and he co comments on nearly all of my tutorials as he also does on so many other fly tying tutorials out there. I always look forward to Sean's comments because they're insightful and he always brings something new to the table. By the way, Sean, I really am looking forward to the day when you start putting out some of your own fly tying tutorials and I can't wait to comment back on them. Well, Sean sent an important email because he mentioned that HMH is no longer selling their hybrid tubing. That's important to note because in part one of my tutorials for these tube flies, I greatly recommended that material above all others. Thus, I decided I better go and right to the horse's mouth and call up HMH. Now to tell you a little bit about this hybrid tubing, the hybrid tubing that they sell is a flexible tubing that you can easily put over the eye of a hook, but it's also rigid enough that you can directly tie on it. To me, that's just a great material. And I contacted HMH and they agreed with me 100%. They stand behind that material and they believe it's a really great product. Unfortunately, it hasn't been selling. And like all the other businesses out there, if they have a product that the customers really don't want, they have to eventually phase it out. And that's what HMH is starting to do. This is the first time that I've been in contact with them. And I can tell you that they have incredible customer service. And more importantly, they are very passionate about tube flies. I uh, talked to them for about 20 minutes on the phone and I learned so much during those 20 minutes. And I'll pass on some of that information to you. Now, regarding that hybrid tubing, they are phasing it out. I did an internet search for it and it's October 2014 right now and you can still purchase it online some other places and I don't know if you should tell HMH this that I told you but they still have a little bit left in their inventory so I think you can call them and purchase some directly from them too. But they're also suggesting that, that we try out these poly tubes. Now I received the poly tubes whenever I purchased the initial, the initial starter pack but I really didn't examine these closely. So after I got off the phone with their representative, I decided to look into these a little bit more. Whenever I pulled one out, I noticed right away that they're relatively rigid and I figured that they would still kind of fall in line with that rigid line of tubes, being that you would need to get some type of a hook holder material to place over them. But then I grabbed a hook, placed this material over the eye and it went over relatively easy. Thus, I believe these probably are a pretty good alternative to that hybrid tubing that they are eventually going to be phasing out. I'm going to be tying with these uh, over the next few weeks and I will feature these in a future video related to this tube fly series. Thus you can just look for it in the comments section. Well getting back to this one and again this is part two I'm going to concentrate on the HMH rigid tubes. I'm going to show you how to use them in there uh, that vice adapter that HMH markets. I'm going to tie a couple different patterns on them and then I'm also going to show you how to finish them. So um, with that said, I'm going to kind of get my video rearranged here, focus it on the vise, and start tying on some of these HMH rigid tubes. To begin, I'm going to be using the starter tube fly tool. Let me pull this out of my vise. This is a really neat device. It's extremely easy to use. They come with two pins. This is the small, and here's the large. The small is 41 thousandths of an inch and the large is 62 thousandths of an inch. And the one that you use is really dependent upon what tube you're going to be selecting. Make sure you know where you place each of these pins because if you don't, they can easily be lost. Trust me, it's happened before. For the actual device, to place it in your vise, you simply open the jaws, place it in as far as possible. I'm going to take the small tube and then tighten. 
Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about these rigid tubes. These are from HMH. They come in two diameters. One is an eighth of an inch and one is three thirty seconds of an inch. Basically a small and a large. This is what it looks like before I trim it. What's interesting about this material is that it's definitely, um, we'll say rigid. It will bend a little bit, but not that much. This is not a material that you can easily place over the eye of a hook. So we have to make some adjustments to the tube whenever we're tying on it. I may first cut this, and I'm going to use a pair of scissors from uh, Rip Lips. These are the scissors that I typically use whenever I'm cutting metals, wires, that type of stuff. I'm not sure if I can use my more precise fly tying scissors, but I'm not going to risk that, even though it is just plastic. And I cut away a small tube. To place this tube into my tool, I simply remove the pin and then push it the whole way to the edge. I'm going to place the pin back in. And then if you look closely, and I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see this better, there's a little catch right here. And what that's intended to do is if you pull that tube tight against that catch and then lock everything in place, nothing's going to turn. Your tube won't turn nor will the pin. So that's one way to tie. This is typically the way that I tie whenever I'm using the mix and match system. Whenever I have a head of a fly and then I use another tube for the tail of a fly. Basically a two-part system. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different and I'm actually going to loosen this adjustment a little bit, press up, and I'm going to pull that tube back. And I want to actually have the tube go back into the device a little bit. I'm going to extend this piece out, just a short section, and then I'm going to tighten. You'll notice the tube will have a, a little incline in it, but that's not going to really make any, any impact whatsoever in terms of the overall fly. I'm actually going to change this around so I can have this piece up. Okay, now the reason I did that was, we'll say there's two parts to it. First of all, some tires just prefer to have it locked in right here because they feel that it definitely is not going to move. It's a lot more secure. I'm not sure if it's any more secure than using this front attachment, but I will tell you that it's definitely secure when you lock it in this way. More importantly though, I'm not able to tie on that section of the tube. And that's important because this tube can't go directly on the hook. Instead, we have to use some hook holder tubing. The tubing material looks like this. It's soft and it's, fl it's flexible, and I have a bunch of these cut into small sections. And here's how they're used. We have my tube in the front, Next, I have the hook holder tubing, and then I have my hook. And what happens, whenever you hook a fish, and you initially set that hook, this part will break away, and this hook will simply remain in the fish. Thus, you won't have to worry about this whatsoever. But you want that hook holder tubing in there, so you keep that fly pushed back close to the hook. Again, by locking it in place, by locking the tube in place in the back, you automatically will just kind of make that adjustment, and you don't have to worry about tying at that point. All right, well, getting to the tying part, I'm going to tie just a very simple fly on this tube. I'm going to be tying a woolly bugger pattern just because it's a great all-around fly that we can use for trout, for steelhead, for smallmouth, for striped bass. And I'm going to use just, a, I'm going to tie a little bit of a longer one. So let me get a couple things kind of resituated here, and then I'll start the tying of this pattern. All right, we're going to start tying this fly like any other pattern that we typically would use. I've already added some lead wire. This is 0.015. I'm going to next add some 6 aught thread. Before I get to that though, I really have to get to the notion of really keeping everything consistent when tying these flies. I don't have a set measurement for the length of this tube. Thus, my proportions might be a little bit off, and you really have to keep that in mind. Whenever I first began tying tube flies, my proportions were absolutely way off. I was adjusting materials and I was doing that incorrectly because I wasn't used to not seeing the eye and the bend of the hook. One piece of advice that I can give is keep a copy of the hook or keep the actual hook you're going to be using close by. By having one then I can get a, kind of an idea of where I want my tail to go and adjust everything accordingly. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that as I go on but it is very neat because this is the hook that I intend on using. However, I can make that adjustment on the river or stream. I can go to a smaller, larger, we'll say a lengthier hook. It really doesn't matter, but I can make those adjustments at any point versus a standard fly that I tie. Once I've tied that fly onto the hook, I'm stuck with that hook until I change hooks. Now, the one thing I want to keep in mind is that I kept this gap here. 
I'm going to be referring to this gap whenever I finish the head of this pattern. As mentioned, I have some 6 aught thread. I'm going to start it back just a little ways. I'm going to be burning the head of this one, and it's going to be burning back towards the thread, so I have to keep that in mind. Aside from this lead, I can also add some type of a bead at the front once I'm fishing the pattern. I can add cone heads because a lot of tires will use cone heads for weight. I could use just a weighted tube if I want. So we have all those options available. All right, the first thing I might do is just tie in some marabou for a woolly bugger. I'm not going to go through uh, everything specifically for this pattern. This is going to be one of my standard woolly bugger ties. Next, I have some schloppen from Clearwater Hackle. I'm going to tie this in by the tips. And then finally, I'm going to be using this little bit of a darker chartreuse chenille uh, that I got from, uh, I believe it's Sparkling Willie's Fly Tying Materials. So if you've noticed right now, I've really done very little different in terms of the tying of the woolly bugger. I did cut a lengthier section of this material because I'm using a little bit of a longer shank. I guess when we're, we're talking about comparing this to some of my standard woolly bugger ties. If I'm going to be tying a, a woolly bugger just for trout fishing on a tube, it's going to be a smaller tube. This one's going to be more interchangeable. This is a tube that I can use in the spring for trout, that I could use any time for stripers, that I can use for steelhead, especially if I'm fishing the mouth of a river. So I'm trying to kind of come up with some all-purpose lengths whenever it comes to these tube flies, but please don't assume that it has to be a lengthy tube. You can use any size, you can use any length of it. The rules, again, are really just up to you. this schlop and I like to space it out accordingly. I really like to see that green showing through these black hackles. And I also love the look that, I, that you get from tying the tips in first. So you get the lengthier fibers at the head really just swirling over the fly. Some of those webbier ones are up by the head too, which will really show great movement in the water. Okay, at this point, I'm just going to finish it like I would finish any normal fly. I'm just going to get a, a, a nice whip finish going. I'm going to add a second one with a little bit of Sally Hansen hard as nails. I'm going to add a little bit of glue now. There's also an opportunity to add it later, and it's really up to you. Sometimes I'll add it at both stages because I really want to make sure these flies are not going to be falling apart. And now we have a, a nearly complete tube fly. Just a really great looking fly. Um, this is definitely one of my go-to color combinations. I love that black gray look over the chartreuse, especially when we have that variegated marabou at the back. Now we gotta finish the head though, and this is really an important part that I wanna take a little bit more time and, and talk to you about. 
At this point, I have really two main options. I, I guess we have a few options. I can add a cone head if I want prior to burning and then burn it and lock it in place. So if I want to add a little bit more weight to give this fly, get this fly down or give it a little bit of a jigging motion, I can do that now. What I'm going to be doing is simply burning it. So I can simply burn and then finish the fly, which is what you're going to notice me doing in just a second. But I keep mentioning that there are no rules in this style. And I want you to keep that in mind because think about what you're going to be doing with this fly. Say I want to convert this into some type of an egg sucking leech. Maybe I didn't use chartreuse, I just have all black. But I don't want to tie that egg on the front because maybe I'm not going to be using that egg sucking leech all the time, but I want to have the egg separate and the leeches separate. Keep that in mind that if you don't burn it, you can always simply just add a little bit of our hook holder tubing at the front and then have a second tube with just the egg tied on it. Thus, you have a tube that you can easily add on to this to give the appearance of that egg sucking leech, that leech that's going after the egg. And then if that doesn't seem to be working, you can fish just the egg itself on a tube. Do you see a lot of guys fishing just eggs on tubes? Absolutely not. That doesn't mean they don't work. I think that a lot of guys just don't think about that style of fishing yet. So keep those options open to you because if you have that availability to kind of switch up, you don't have to worry about having a, whole, a dozen egg sucking leeches, a dozen leeches, a dozen eggs. Instead, you can have just a few of each and then have different combinations. You can add different colors of eggs to that leech and you don't have to worry about always having a black leech with a pink egg. You'll have lots of options that are available to you. So please keep that in mind. I'm gonna show you some examples of that in a future video. For this one though, I'm gonna go immediately to the burn. I wanna make sure this is how the fly, how I want this fly to look and, and this is really it. I wanna keep that marabou at the front because I know I'm gonna have some good movement in the water. I see something hanging off there. I think that's just some cut chenille. Now that it's gone, I'm gonna to turn to the burn. Now in this case, I really need to caution you, be careful whenever you're using your flame. You're gonna notice that a lot of your fly tying materials are really combustible. They'll just go up really quick. They're dry materials, they're very light, they're very delicate, and they burn in seconds. Trust me because I have burned a fly already and I don't want you to make the same mistake that I did. Luckily there was no disaster. We didn't have to call the fire department. I don't even know if my wife smelled the feathers burning, but I wanna make, kind of give you that caution. Now the reason I left this excess point right here is because of that. I'm actually gonna heat this metal with the flame first and then move back towards the head of the fly. As I'm doing that, you'll notice this end of the plastic will cup and it will eventually curve over my thread. And that's what I'm going for. I lower the flame just a bit. And that's it. I don't have to have it cup any bit more that is more than enough. Now I can always extend that piece a little bit and have it go back further over my, over my thread wraps, but I'm not gonna worry so much about that. At this point, if you wanna add a little bit more head cement, you can. This is a point where I would grab some head cement and put it around there while that plastic is drying. And you can see that plastic turning white, more of that opaque look now versus the clear it had whenever I first burned it. So I know that it's nearly dry. To remove this from my pin, I'm simply gonna loosen Push everything forward just a bit, the fly, and then I'm gonna just relock it against the pin. So I just have this piece right here locked against the pin. The tube is forward. Now I can simply just turn the tube with my hand, get everything so that that plastic, which is just burnt to the, to the pin, is now gonna be free. Don't worry about being delicate. I can assure you the fish will not be. Next I can loosen, take the pin out. It's not hot anymore and slide the fly off. Now I have my completed woolly bugger with just a great looking pattern. I notice that sometimes at the very head, there's a little piece of plastic is just coming off after the burn. I can just cut that away with my scissors and you could always simply just use sandpaper too. Now, if we think about how this is gonna look on our finished fly, let me give you kind of that, that overview of what this is gonna look like. Let me find my little tube that I seem to have misplaced. Okay, so I have my holder tubing. I just carry a bunch of these. I'm gonna slide it onto that exposed section of the tube, that section that I left just for this purpose. I'm gonna grab my hook. This is around a size six or eight 
octopus hook from Allen Fly Fishing. This is their MP001. I'm going to put that on the end, and now I have that hook perfectly concealed. Now what's great about this system, look at where my hook is right now. I have some feathers going over the end of it. Say I'm fishing and I start to get a lot of short strikes, I can easily change this and I can put on a larger hook. I can put a hook with a longer shank and have that hook extend out past the tail. That way if I'm getting those short strikes, I can really make up for it and find a way to make a, make a change to accommodate for that immediately on the river. Whenever you have just a standard woolly bugger tied, where that hook is is where it's going to stay. The only adjustment you can truly make is by trimming away your marabou, which will never grow back in length. So this is a really nice feature of these tube flies, is the, the ability to vary that hook location. I'm just going to pop the hook off. I may take this hook holder tubing off. Easier said than done. I don't want to pull away my, my materials. And there's one more look at my finished woolly bugger. So I hope you um, got the gist of this initial, we'll say, fly tying with tube flies. This is a very easy process. It's really smooth. It goes quick. And if you've tied flies in the past, this is really not going to be that big of a change for you. You can see that it went really smooth for me. This was easy. It was just like tying a woolly bugger. The only difference was that I was using a tube. So let me give you a full look at this fly. Well, with that said, um, I truly appreciate the view. Um, I really appreciate all the comments that I received after the first part of this series. And if you have any additional comments for part two, please leave them directly on this YouTube page, or you can email me at tkamisa at gmail.com. If you like this video and you want to see more like it, you can check out my website, which is troutandfeather.com. There's also a contact link on that page. A lot of people have sent comments through there, and I appreciate all of them. Finally, if you are a Facebook user, feel free to like Trout and Feather. Well, again, thank you everybody for viewing this YouTube fly tying tutorial. This was Tube Flies Part 2. More to come in the future.